Well, it, it is very important that we pray for our pastor search team. One of the things you need to pray for is their safety because you know in Baptist life we steal preachers. <laughs> you know, you just go in. You, they try to go in covert. It's always funny if you're a pastor when a pulpit uh, committee comes in because they always try to come in in covert ways and you can spot them a mile away. I just want you to know. <laughs> Uh, I remember one time in Louisiana, I was in this little church and we were bursting at the seams and a pastor search team came in and the only place for them to sit, all six of them, was on the front pew. <laughs> now, I promise you that church knew there was a committee in the house, all right? Besides that, I preached way better than I usually did. It's amazing. Um, second thing, it's very important for me to tell you, that uh, next Sunday we don't wear these anymore for a month, Okay. Some thought it was supposed to be today, I can tell. You got it wrong, but it's next Sunday. I'm not sure I can preach, but I'm going to try uh, without a tie on. Well, all of that nonsense. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, if you'll go on over a little further also to 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, because we're going to read that text as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me sort of get us started here. Um, we are uh, in a study on the Holy Spirit, the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we have talked about uh, the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in the life of every believer. If you're born again, if you've turned from sin and put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Scripture says you are, you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you are placed into Christ, you are placed into the, into the body of Christ, as we're going to read this morning, and that he empowers you to do his work in the life of the church and in the service of Christ, and that, that every believer, every believer has the person of the Holy Spirit living in us. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, that being said, God has given us his presence in our lives for multitudes of reasons. But he has empowered us for special reasons. Number one, we have seen he empowers us so that we might be a bold witness for Christ. And this morning, we want to look at his empowering us so that we might exercise and utilize the spiritual gifts that he has given us to his glory and to his honor and to the work of the body of Christ. In fact, it is amazing to me that when you read the context of this scripture and all of those that are related to spiritual gifts, which I will define in a moment, but when you read them, they're in the context of the body of Christ. You know, I sometimes meet people and they say to me, I'll, I'll ask them the, the question about their personal walk with Christ and I'll ask them if they're a believer or do you know Christ or have you come to the place in your spiritual life where you know for certain that if you died today, you'd, go, you'd spend an eternity in heaven? And they will say yes. And then I'll talk with them about the church and they'll say, oh, well, you know, I just don't believe in organized religion. I don't believe in organized religion either, by the way. But I do believe in the church. That's different. Or they will say something like this. Well, you know, I just think you can worship God anywhere you, you know that you uh, feel right about worshiping him. And I would say to you, you're right. I can worship God anywhere. I can worship him on the golf course, but I don't because I don't golf for one thing. <laughs> the question is not whether you can. The fact of the matter is, will, will you? That's the real question. But when all of that has been settled, when you read the New Testament, you are hard-pressed to come away with any other conclusion than the Scripture is very plain. We are not Lone Ranger Christians. And the Bible never describes us as being somebody who is a Lone Ranger, who does their own thing in their own way and worships God in however they want to. No, I'll tell you, we need to worship God in the way He wants us to worship Him. And we don't just have the right to serve God in whatever ways we want to serve him. We ought to serve him in the way he desires for us. And by the way, God's desire is for us to serve him in the context of the church, which is the body of Christ. And when he talks about spiritual gifts, he does so within the framework of the body of Christ. Spiritual gifts are not given for us to use to our own 
and grandizement and to our own puffing up, but they are to be used within the context of the church, the body of Christ. And so with that introduction, I want us to read in the context of the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, I'm going to, I told them that we were going to start reading in four, but I'm going to cheat. I want to start reading in verse one, all right? Here's what he says. Paul has been answering, by the way, in 1 Corinthians, uh, this church at Corinth was so fouled up and messed up, it's unbelievable. If you read what Paul had to say to them, trying to straighten out messes in the church. And one of them had to do with spiritual gifts. And so he begins this by saying, now about matters of the spirit. And the word is pneumaticon. We get the word uh, pneumatic. You, you've heard of a pneumatic tube. It's just a tube that, that uh, air goes through. And he uses this term, and it is a term that describes the work and the power of the Spirit and is often translated just simply and now about spiritual gifts. Some of your translations will have it that way, and it's very right to do so. Paul is saying, I want to answer your questions. You have gotten caught up in some things in regard to spiritual gifts, and it's clear you don't understand what they are. You don't, you don't understand you don't understand what spiritual gifts have been given for. You don't understand how they're to be exercised. In fact, you are just ignorant, and I, I don't want you to stay that way. I want you to understand spiritual gifts. So he says about matters of the Spirit, brothers, I don't want you to be unaware, or ignorant is the right word. You know how when you were pagans, you were led to dumb idols being led astray. Therefore, I'm informing you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, he's not describing that you can't mouth those words. You can say those words, but what he is indicating is that you can't declare Jesus Christ as Lord in your life, else you have come to the con under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and you have been saved by the grace of God and by the mercy of God in your life through repentance and faith. And so he lays that out very plain as a platform. And then he says, okay, now let me talk to you about spiritual gifts. Verse number four, now there are different gifts, but the same spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different activities or workings is the word that is used here. But the same God is active in everyone and in everything. A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person to produce what is beneficial. And I actually like another translation that says it like this, that there's a manifestation of the Spirit that is given to each person for the common good, because that's the way this word can be translated, I think, and gives a little clear meaning. It is not just beneficial, but beneficial for all of us or for the body. That's what he's referring to. And then in verses 8 through 10, he lists spiritual gifts. By the way, there are three different places in Scripture where spiritual gifts are given. Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and then in 1 Peter chapter 4 that we're going to look at, he gives us some of the gifts. Are they all the gifts that are given or that are, that are outlined? I don't know whether that is true or not, and I don't think anybody else can say so, but I can tell you it's a good list to work from. And I think it's a good place to go to begin to understand spiritual gifts within the body of Christ. And then down in verse 11, I want you to, to read with me, but one and the same Spirit is active in all these things. This word, by the way, we get our word energy from. It's the same word up there where he talks about uh, different activities or different workings. One and the same is, Spirit is active in all of these, distributing to each one as he wills. For as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many are but one, so also is Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. That's spirit baptism, as we talked about when you become a follower of Christ. At that moment, you are baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. Not water, but by the Spirit. And whether Jews or Greeks or whether slaves are free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. He's leveling the ground. Everybody's on the same level with Christ. Doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor or whether you are of one race or another. None of that divides us. We are one together in Christ. So the body is not one part but many. And then he describes 
how the body is many different parts, and he makes clear emphasis that no one needs to feel like that if I don't have one of the showier gifts that puts me on a stage where everybody can see me, that somehow I am less important than the person who stands in front of everybody. He is very clear to say every part of the body is essential so that the body can function as the body of Christ to his glory. Every person and every spiritual gift is important. In fact, I would say to you that the reason that the body is dysfunctional sometimes is because there are people that are sitting on a pew who ought to be involved in the ministry and the life of the church because they are spiritually gifted to do so. So that the body is designed that every part must work. And I think about it like this. I will tell you that if your little toe gets cut off and you try to walk, you'll find out how significant that little toe is. You will lose balance. And by the way, if the little pancreas stops working, you're in big trouble. And if the thyroid stops working, and, and I could go on and on, the picture is that every part of the body is absolutely significant and every spiritual gift is vital to the functioning of the body of Christ and for the good of all of us. And so with that background, I want you to turn over now to 1 Peter chapter 4. And we'll come back and look at this a little more in a moment. Look at verse 10. And again, in the context of the body, he says, now based on the gift they have received, uh, you can translate it like this, uh, based on every, or every person has received a gift. That's the idea. So based on the gift that has been received, everyone should use it to serve others as good managers, another way of saying good, tr- good stewards of the varied grace of God. If anyone speaks, his speech should be like the oracles of God. And if anyone serves, his service should be from the strength of, that God provides. That is not in our flesh, not out of our own context, not of our own giftedness or talents, but rather out of the strength and the power of God that resides within us. So then everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, I want to take a few minutes to talk with you about spiritual gifts because it is essential when you think about the work of the Spirit within the individual life and the work of the Holy Spirit within the church collectively, there is no more significant issue than spiritual gifts. Now, the tragedy is in Baptist life, we rarely talk about them because we are afraid that somehow we'll be mistaken as being Pentecostal. Well, let me just relax you. We don't need to be Pentecostal or charismatic. We just need to be Baptists who believe the whole book. And we just need to be Baptists who practice the whole book. And if we'll just do that, we'll be fine. We can relax. We don't have to get uptight about anything. And so Paul outlines for us the spiritual gifts that God gives us and says, by the way, I want you to understand how important this is. He says, I want to talk about this matter of spiritual gifts. Now, he uses two words to describe them. I've already talked about the first one. It has the word pneuma, which is the word for spirit in it, and it, it describes spiritual gifts. The idea is that they are of the spirit. They are spirit produced in our lives. He uses a second word, which is charismaticon. We get our word charismatic from it. And it is used, in fact, it is is built off of the word charis or for grace. So that he uses the idea of grace. Our gifts are grace gifts. So when you put those two together, a spiritual gift is a gift of the Holy Spirit that is by the grace of God in our lives, it is a spiritual empowerment or capacity or ability for us to be able to do ministry in the work of Christ to his glory. Now, I want to take a moment to to distinguish between what I would call a talent or a skill and a spiritual gift. Sometimes they look very similar, and by the way, I believe that God shapes us. He uses all of our backgrounds and all of our abilities and our training, and he uses all of that to his glory if we will yield it to him. But a spiritual gift is something beyond fleshly ability, talent, and skill. 
A spiritual gift is a supernatural endowment from God in your life and in mine. And as I'm going to show you in a moment, when a spiritual gift is exercised in ministry, the end result is that God has done a work through us and his power in us is revealed as we exercise our spiritual gift and therefore he gets glory because people don't brag about us, they brag about him and his work in us. And I think it's very important. You say, well, does that mean that everybody who preaches has the spiritual gift of preaching? And the answer to that is no. And you say, well, I've heard some. I didn't think I had it either. <laughs> Maybe you're thinking that this morning. Just don't tell me. It'll hurt my feelings, all right? No, I don't think everybody that happens to step into a pulpit happens to have a spiritual gift for, for preaching or, or for um, for encouragement or a spiritual gift of prophecy. But I will tell you what distinguishes somebody who makes a great speech and somebody who is preaching a sermon endowed by the Holy Spirit are the spiritual results in the lives of those who are hearing. That when he speaks, when he communicates, that the Spirit of God is working in such a way that your spirit bears witness with his spirit that he is speaking the truth of God into your life and there is something supernatural about what is going on. On in the moment so that it is a supernatural work. Everybody that stands on the stage and sings, I've heard some incredible, beautiful singers, but when they sang, it was just good music. But I've heard others who weren't quite as gifted and talented who stood and sang, and when they did, my heart was broken and my heart was inspired and my life was challenged because the Spirit of the Holy Spirit of God was working in and through them. That is the difference between a talent or a skill and a spiritual gift. The question is, does the Holy Spirit of God, is he at work when they are exercising their spiritual gift? Because after all, if it is a fleshly thing, it is not spiritual. How you like that for brilliance? All right? If it is a fleshly exercise, that's all it is. But when it is spiritual, it is supernatural, and God is at work. Now, let me prove that to you. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and look down at verse 4. Here's what he says. Now, there are different gifts. By the way, that word difference is in the emphatic position. It means that that is the emphasis. He is saying, I want you to understand that there are diverse, there's a diversity of spiritual gifts in the body. Everybody is not made the same. Everybody doesn't look the same. Everybody doesn't act the same. That God uses our individuality, our individuality, and he, and, and he gives us a multiplicity of gifts in the body so that the body can function the way it is intended to function. So he said there are diverse gifts, but listen, he says, Every one of those gifts comes by the Spirit. In fact, if you look down a little later in verse 12, he says, a manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person. And in verse 11, 11 he says, they are distributed to each one as he wills. You say, well, I, I don't like the spiritual gift that God, in fact, most of us don't even know what it is. And that's tragic. But you say, and some of you who do, you say, well, I don't like the one I got. I'd like to have one that's different. Well, you know what? When you do that, you are casting a reflection on God's Holy Spirit that you don't need to cast. Because when God saved you and he called you into his body, he assigns you a spiritual gift that you can use to his glory and his honor and to the good of the church and to the body, and he has given to you exactly what he wants you, the place he wants you to play the body, the work that he wants you to accomplish. He has given it to you, and he has given you supernaturally a spiritual gift to accomplish it. It is the work of his grace in your life. And so you need to rejoice and thank God for the spiritual gift that he has given you and not, not cower away from it on the one hand and on the other hand not take pride in it. You know, the fact is those of us who are on the stage, we can say, well, you know what? I'm more important to the body because I'm the one up here talking to everybody. So I'm, I'm the most important part of the body. The only problem with that, that denies the very teaching of the Scripture. 
I'm up here preaching today not because I am smarter, better than anybody else. I am simply here because it is what God has gifted me to do and what God has called me to do. And my part in the body, I'm going to be judged one day by what I have done with God's grace gift in my life and how I've exercised it, not by the scope in the sense that I got to talk to a lot of people and you just get to be a Sunday school teacher, a preschoolers. I'm going to tell you, you're going to be judged on what you have done with what God gave you and how you exercised your gift no differently than I am mine. And the measuring rod is not going to be whether you were talking to thousands. It's going to be whether you were faithful to who you talked to. And if you have the gift of service, the issue is not going to be whether you were able to preach or to teach. It's going to be whether you exercise the gift of service that God has given you. And I could go on and on. The point is, that God's Holy Spirit has gifted you. You know, um, I remember that they, they have gifted programs in the school. That Usually that's for people that are smarter. I never was in one of those, by the way. <laughs> you say, I knew that already. <laughs> but in the church, giftedness does not mean you are smarter or better. It simply means that you are taking what God has sovereignly designed for your life and you are willing to use it to the betterment of the church and to the glory of God himself. That's what it means. Now, the next part of this verse 4, he said there are also different ministries. The idea again is difference in the emphatic position. He's emphasizing there is a whole, let me use a great Oklahoma term, there's a whole gob of ministries, all right? So that God is, has given all kinds of ministries within his body, and he has given those ministries for us to perform. You know what? We are never more like Jesus when we are serving. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. It's the same word that is used here. The idea is that God has given you a place of service in the body. He expects you to accept that responsibility and that calling in your life And by the way, he has given you the the spiritual gift to exercise in that ministry. And when you do, the body is better off because of it. You say, well, I think my spiritual gift is sitting on a pew. I didn't find one of those. Uh, You say, well, I I just don't have, I, I just don't think I have anything. That's not true. You have a spiritual gift. You say, well, I don't know. How do I find it? You pray and you ask God to show you. He will reveal it to you. The Holy Spirit doesn't want you to hunt like a needle in a haystack. He wants to show you what your spiritual gift is. And by the way, God is in the business of calling us in the church to our ministry. You say, I don't have a ministry in the church. That is not God's fault. Listen, God is as concerned about calling you to spiritual ministry in the life of the church as he is about calling a pastor to come and work in this church. Because if I read the scripture right in 1 Corinthians 12, you are as vital to the body as anybody else. And the issue in the life of the church, are you willing to hear the Holy Spirit speak to your heart and call you? Do you realize that God, I believe that God in his sovereignty would never put his church together and then leave, not call people to do the ministries that he wants done in the church. That's why there should never be a, a Sunday school class that doesn't have a teacher. Never, never be a little child back there in the nursery and the preschool area that doesn't have somebody serving and meeting their need. And by the way, they do. There's an, there are openings back there. That just shouldn't happen. You say, are you trying to guilt me into something? No, because guilt will only last you about two seconds. I'm simply trying to get you to have your ears on and to listen internally to the working of the Holy Spirit and to begin praying, God, I want to know what my ministry is in the church. And I want to know what my spiritual gift is that you have given me so that I can bless you and bless the church and bless the work that goes on. So, Holy Spirit, will you show me? I want to exercise my spiritual gift in the ministry that you have called me to. And you listen, some of those ministries will be on a stage. Some of them will be before a class. Some of them will be in the background and nobody will see you. But they are vital to the working and the ministry of the church. 
And then he uses one last word that I think is so important in verse 4. Listen to what he says. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different activities. Again, the word is energy. We get our word energy from it. There are different workings, but the same God is active in everyone and everything. (laughs) Now again, what's the emphasis? Everybody in the body. And he says, whenever you are, use your spiritual gift in ministry, the Holy Spirit of God, God himself, is going to work in you and empower you so that when you exercise your spiritual gift, if it's a gift of service and cleaning toilets, you're going to do the best job anybody else has ever done. And you say, well, I don't believe God would give me that kind of, listen, God is in the business of exercising in the body everything that needs to be taken care of. And if you have the gift of service, you ought to rejoice in it and use that spiritual gift to God's glory. So he says, God will exercise. He'll empower you. He'll work in you and through you so that you are doing his work his way under his power, not just in the flesh. So everybody has a spiritual gift. It is essential that the body works and functions properly and, is, and the work of the kingdom is done in the body the way God wants it. He is the one that chooses your spiritual gift and gives it to you. And our desire ought to be, Lord, you show me what it is and show me the ministry you want me to do and I will do it because I want to be faithful to your will. And remember, we often ask the question, what is God's will for my life? He just told you. Here's my will for you. You are to serve. You are to find a place and make your way in the body of Christ and to do so exercising and using your spiritual gifts. Now, I think there's another thing that, you need to, that I need to emphasize. He says in verse 7 and over in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10 that spiritual gifts are given for a specific reason. Number one, he says, for the common good. And in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10, he says, spiritual gifts are given so that we might serve one another. Now, you see, that's why I say there can't be a Lone Ranger Christian. Listen, you didn't get saved so you could go, uh, you know, hold on to your ticket to heaven and say, well, my ticket's been punched and that's all I need to worry about. God saved you and he created you. Do you remember what Ephesians chapter 2 says? We're saved by grace through faith, but why? He says, because I have created you unto good works, Ephesians 2.10. So that God has given you spiritual gifts, he has given you a ministry, and that ministry is so that you can serve other people in the body of Christ, and so that you can do things that will bring good to the whole body, not just to yourself. That's why when you, get a, when you discover your spiritual gift and you get all excited about it and you think, well, you know what? I've got a spiritual gift, so I'm better than everybody else. You're just playing a game that goes nowhere. The only reason God has given you your spiritual gift is so that you can help your brothers and sisters, so you can encourage them and minister to them and serve them, and so the body functions the way it's supposed to function. So it's for the common good. I believe also that as you think about your spiritual gift and God's giving it to you and placing it in your life, that you need to also understand that God is going to hold you responsible. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10, he says, we are to use our spiritual gifts as good managers or good stewards. Now, do you remember 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4? He said it something like this. He said, here is what is required of a steward, that he be found. What's the word? Somebody say it. Faithful. Faithful. Let's say it together. Faithful. So it is required of a steward that he be found. That means that when God places a spiritual gift in your life, and if you're a Christian, he has, that God is going to look at you and expect you to use it in ministry for the good of the church. And that spiritual gift, he is going to hold you accountable for the way you use it. And whether you use it, whether you even care enough to discover what it is and whether you're willing then to apply it in the ministry of the church. 
so that one day you're going to stand before God and he's going to say, I want to know what you have done with what I have given you. You remember the, the uh, parable of the talents? And we talk about the person who had the most talents, and we say, well, well, after all, he was the guy that God really re- was going to bless. No, he blessed the guy that had the second most talents, just like he did the first one, and the reason was because they were both faithful with what they had been given. Now, the question is, Are you willing to be faithful with the spiritual gift that God has applied in your life? Are you willing to say, Lord, I'm not going to sit on a pew any longer. I'm going to find out what you want me to do. I'm willing to do it. If it's to mow the grass, if it's to sweep the parking lot, if it's whatever you want me to do, I am willing to do it, but I will do it for your glory and for your honor. And I will do it so that I am serving other people in the body of Christ. Because one day, God is going to say, I want to know what you did with what I gave you. You know, we often think about stewardship only as stewardship of money. And by the way, we ought to be good stewards of our money. And we'll be held accountable for that. But I'm going to tell you, God is going to hold us accountable for what he has done in our lives spiritually. He didn't give us the Holy Spirit to just give us chill bumps up and down our spine. He didn't give the Holy Spirit to indwell us just so that we can feel good about having Christ in our hearts, as wonderful as that is. He didn't let the Holy Spirit come and baptize us. And listen to this. Paul says, by the way, residing in you is the same power. Listen to this. The same power that brought Jesus Christ out of the grave. Why would he invest all of that spiritual power in you simply to come and sit on a pew and listen and go home? I don't believe he did. I believe he invested that spiritual power in you because he wants you to be on mission for Christ serving his church, serving your Christ and your Lord and Savior, and doing so so that his body has all of its needs met, and ultimately God himself is glorified. Now, there shouldn't be a place in this church where there is a need for somebody to serve in some capacity or some ministry that he desires to be fulfilled, that there's not somebody ready to step up and take that ministry. And the sad part about a church is that so many times we look like a football stadium of spectators watching other people on the field when God intends for every one of us to be on the field and at work and at play, exercising our spiritual gifts to his glory. You say, well, preacher, I don't have a clue what my spiritual gift is. Then I'm going to challenge you this morning to get on your face before God and to say, God, I'm going to study Scripture. I'm going to ask you, show me what my spiritual gifting is, and then I want to exercise it and use it to your glory. And I want to help the church so that there's nothing in the church that isn't accomplished because I'm just sitting down and not exercising the gift you've given me. And Lord, you have empowered me with your Holy Spirit, and I want to be used of you. Man, that ought to be the heart of every Christian, every child of God, every believer, because here's the truth. You are gifted. Let's pray.